Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I'm uh, Namrata Lemay from Intel, and uh, with me I have uh, Sandeep Nagapatinam here from Intel, my colleague. So we will both be presenting um, a talk on uh, Linux kernel networking acceleration uh, using P4 on IPU. So this is the agenda. So we are going to start with the introduction, um, and then I'll present the architecture for IPU offloading, uh, the one that we are using to offload um, networking from kernel. Um, and talk about a little bit about the P4 control plane that we are using. Uh, then I have the P4 components in details. Um, I won't go too much into it and stick with the kernel explanations. Uh, we have uh, created a Linux networking pipeline um, that is used to support um, some funct uh, networking functionality like VXLAN and routing. I'll be talking about that and uh, then how we um, offload from the kernel uh, routing tables into your um, hardware pipeline, the IPU hardware pipeline. Um, I have a IPU a hardware generic block diagram next uh, to explain the different components of the hardware. And then um, I will be explaining how we map the Linux networking functionality, uh, which we are uploading from the kernel into the hardware. Um, and then I'll hand over to Sandeep. And uh, Sandeep is going to go over the P4 program snippets, a little example that we have here, uh, followed by um, the kernel notifications, how we are converting uh, the netlinks to Cyan to the P4 table that, that is in the hardware. Um, then we have the packet processing in IPU and uh, how do we send packets to kernel for um, ARP and FRR use cases. And then I have some useful links to end with. So uh, to start with, um, kernel Linux kernel has a powerful networking stack uh, that supports switching and routing capabilities and uh, handles protocols such as LAG and ECMP. Um, it also supports connection tracking and security firewalls. So in this um, effort, we have uh, tried to offload um, the routing capabilities, uh, the switching capabilities, ECMP, and connection tracking into the IPU completely. So this is driven by the Linux kernel tables, um, and we listen to Netlink notifications um, and accelerate these tables into um, the IPU hardware using P4. Um, so um, so this, the CT functionality here is completely offloaded into kernel. So I will go over how we do, how we use, use the PNA auto add capability to, um, uh, to derive CT rules um, from the state tables, just like how kernel does. And then we have, uh, we also use open vSwitch is primarily used for virtual networking. Uh, kernel is used for physical networking. So we have open vSwitch as a virtual switch um, uh, component that um, works with our entire architecture. Um, and open vSwitch also uses the kernel stack to support most of the virtual switching capabilities. So when we configure VXLAN into open vSwitch that actually gets configured in the kernel. We read the kernel um, uh, updates for uh, VXLAN, and that's how we uh, uh, port the VXLAN into the hardware. So uh, the, uh, the the talk is um, basically um, we have taken Intel IPU E2000 as an example because we were able to run this on the Intel IPU, and we could accelerate most of the networking uh, functionality that I explained uh, in the hardware using um, this IPU. So this is the architecture for IPO floating. We call it P4 control plane. Um, this There is an infra P4 decomponent. So this is the main component um, that we have created. This is open sourced under IPTK um, and um, under networking recipe, GitHub, if, um, if you want to check. So there are three uh, interfaces uh, to the external uh, uh, SDN controller and uh, CLIs from this infra P4D. Um, one is P4 runtime, open config, and I won't go too much into it, but I'll focus on the Psi kernel um, um, interface that we have, um, that we have implemented uh, in the infra P4D to um, offload the kernel elements into the hardware. So here, the Psi element basically listens to the kernel notifications that come in for the routing tables and the tunnel tables. And then um, this is uh, offloaded into the IPU using TDI. This is the tar table driven interface. And this is also um, uh, open sourced under P4Lang um, along with a target backend, um, which is which could be um, DBDK in the software um, and um, or IPU. Uh, so here we have taken IPU as an example. Then um, so. 
uh, what happens here is we create a P4 uh, pipeline. We write uh, the entire pipeline in P4. So your VXLAN, your L2, L3 switching, uh, routing capabilities, everything gets written in P4. This P4 is compiled uh, by P4C to different uh, to generate different artifacts that go in each of these layers and uh, programs your backend. So your front end and your backend will have the same information of uh, how your uh, control pipeline looks like. And then we have um, uh, here we have Open vSwitch. So we have Open vSwitch so um, uh, to support the virtual networking and and to support the uh, uh, the the handling of packets that the P4 pipeline uh, did not want to support. So here uh, we what we have um, uh, made to work is we send the R packets from the IPU to uh, the OVS to uh, basically offload the L2 table entries here to get the R resolution and offload the L2 table entries. So for kernel, we, we use kernel for FRR. So our um, control packets, routing control packets are going to go to the uh, kernel in the same way um, and get processed by the kernel stack. Other components are a CLI that uh, we have to program the P4 runtime and open config rules. And uh, the same could be done by the SDN controller here using uh, gRPC messages. So this is this slide gives um, a detailed overview of the components. Um, so as I explained, infra P4D is basically um, runs the kernel monitor, kernel mon, um, and um, also P4 runtime and open config servers. And all of three are interfaced into a TDI to program your um, um, IPU uh, target here, the P4 capable target here. We, we've used Statum to um, provide the P4 runtime and open config capabilities, and that is integrated into the infra P4D. Uh, TDI is also linked. Uh, it's an open source, as I said. Um, it's linked into your. Um, uh, it, it's linked into the um, top layer of uh, the, the API, the Stratum API that we have. And then the kernel monitor. Uh, so this receives the RFC 3549 messages from the Linux kernel over a Netlink socket um, in case any modifications are done to the kernel. So if you um, um, execute an IP route command to uh, enable ECMP or uh, add a route, this will basically uh, come over the Netlink to the kernel monitor. And this kernel monitor uh, listens to the network events and programs these um, events and uh, the routing tables into the P4 uh, tables via SI and TDI. So driver code is linked with the TDI to interface with the hardware and software P4 data planes. So this is the Linux networking pipeline um, that we have written. Uh, this is written in P4. And um, here is the pictorial representation of this file. Um, I have. I have the link for this file in the uh, last uh, useful links page. So there you can see the entire P4 code. Uh, this code is written in PNA, which is the P4 NIC architecture that supports uh, some constructs of, uh, of P4 tables um, and actions, which uh, the PSA does not support and is more um, uh, and is better suited for um, offloading on NICs. So uh, if you see this pipeline, there is um, an L2 forward tunnel and cap table here uh, that gets programmed. Um, it's in gray. So the color coding is basically uh, the yellow parts. The yellow tables are offloaded from the P4 runtime or TDI layer. Um, the, 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 the tables that come in from kernel are, uh, are in gray. Um, the green table is the auto add table. This is generated entirely in the hardware um, based on the inputs into some other table. Here it is the CD state table. And there's a hash block which calculates the hash, so that's in blue. So basically, um, what happens here is there's an L2 uh, forward tunnel end cap. This is the TX direction. So when a packet comes in from the TX direction, basically VM2 wire, um, the packet will hit this table and it will have a certain action to um, execute. So uh, here the action will be end cap and then sending the packet to the port. And um, then we have the LT L3 routing capability. This is also driven by kernel. This matches on the IP address um, and basically provides the next hop uh, or um, sends to the ECMP table if the next hop is determined from the ECMP table. Um, and then we have the next hop uh, table and the neighbor and drift tables, which determine the, um, because we end cap the packet here, we need the outer nest MAC and uh, the source MAC, and uh, that is determined from these tables. So all of these gray tables are basically coming in from kernel. 
um, and um, are mapped into your um, IPU hardware. So basically, if if your uh, match entry is just a MAC address and um, uh, the action is to NCAP, or um, uh, if the match uh, match table is um, matching on port and um, uh, and does an NCAP and send to a port, it could fit into an exact match block. Uh, your L3 routing, because it matches on um, IP address, it will um, map onto the uh, longest prefix match table if you have. Um, the CT state table uh, matches on different flags in the TCP packet. So this is Synac, SynSynac ACK, and um, so it this table is more suited for a wildcard um, kind of a table. And then we have the exact match again, which is the auto add table, uh, where um, it listens to the CT state table and then generates the entries into the auto add table. So we followed pretty much similar logic as we have in kernel to uh, support connection tracking here. Um, and then a uh, hash is calculated for ECMP, and then ECMP determines the next hop table. Uh, this could again be ex exact match. Um, there are modification tables here, which will do the end cap and set the outer header um, uh, and the outer um, destination MAC and source MAC addresses. So this basically summarizes the uh, Linux networking pipeline that we have uh, come up with. Um, and the actual code, the P4 code for this pipeline is in the link that is in, on the last slide, if you want to check out. Similarly, we have the um, Rx direction. So in the Rx direction, again, we have uh, the uh, the decap table here. The packet is coming from the wire, so it could, uh, could be decapped here. And then again, the CT state table. Here, the CT auto add table is going to be common between the Rx and Tx, so both directions could uh, program to could create entries into the auto add table. Um, so again, uh, going to the TDT resolution, we have this control plane block. So this control plane block um, and this match is important because um, if uh, if a protocol is or a functionality is not handled by your hardware pipeline, the P4 pipeline, and is uh, uh, supposed to be sent up to the uh, kernel or to OVS. This is the table that is programmed to send the packet to the right port from um, from the IPU, so it gets um, gets into the kernel stack, and uh, the kernel stack basically processes the packet. If it's a BGP control packet um, uh, dealing with FRR, it is it's going to be uh, uh, handled by the kernel, and uh, the kernel open vSwitch dot um, open vSwitch module uh, uh, is used to basically send the R packets up to the user space. So, uh, so this this uh, is programmed by P4 runtime, but the packets here that are coming in are going to be handled by your kernel or your um, OVS. Now, there could be some packets which are which cannot be handled by uh, the P4 pipeline or um, the kernel or OVS and needs a, a rule offload from um, the SDN controller. We call these exception packets, uh, like SDN, and uh, these packets are sent to the P4 runtime stack. So my gRPC uh, to the SDN controller. The same way, uh, from the packets could be coming from the wire, and these could be sent to the control flow, which is the kernel or um, the user space uh, switches. This is a generic um, IPU hardware block diagram, um, and uh, in an IPU, you could uh, have different blocks, which are uh, which could um, be exact match, or longest prefix match, uh, wildcard match, or a range checker, and then we have hashing, and uh, then the packet modifier is usually in the hardware pipeline is at the end. So all this, uh, all these um, uh, capabilities are covered by PNA architecture, and uh, that is why we have to uh, we should write um, the P4 in in the PNA architecture to uh, to um, have the P4 tables aligned with the IPU hardware. And then the packet could be recirculated. Um, different IPUs will have different capabilities of recirculation and different number. Um, packet could be sent out, um, out um, to the VM or the wire as well from um, IPU. So um, I've shown the high IPU blocks, and then I went over the um, P4 table. And uh, here is basically how the mappings look like uh, from the kernel functionality that we are offloading into the IPU hardware blocks. So uh, we have VXLAN tables that uh, get programmed into OVS or kernel. 
um, uh, using uh, configuration commands. And uh, these uh, tables are basically mapped onto the exact match and the actual end cap and decap happens in the modification block. Then we have L2 tables. So L2 table uh, comes from OVS in our case. Um, so this is an exact match table. L3 routing table comes from the kernel, uh, the routing tables in the kernel uh, using the IP route command. So whenever these tables change, uh, this change is propagated into the longest prefix match table, uh, which matches on the IP address. ECMP again uh, can be configured um, uh, in the kernel and uh, this goes into the hash block. Um, RSS uh, goes into the hash block again in the Rx direction. Um, and then we have the connection tracking state table, which is a wildcard match, um, basically matching on the uh, TCP flags uh, with, and generates the, the tuple table, the five tuple table that we use in kernel for connection tracking and uh, security firewalls. And this table is basically an exact match with PNA add-on miss capability. So on a miss onto the... Um, onto this table, um, an entry will be added uh, given on the metadata in the state table, how the metadata is set in the state table. Then we have the exception table to SDN controller, and that is an exact match. And um, uh, the VLAN mapping or the table, the control flow tables uh, go into the exact match as well. So after this, I will hand over to Sandeep to, um, uh, to talk about the B4 program that we have. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, um, Sandeep, do you want to take over? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for Namrata for a great explanation. Um, yeah, so uh, here is our uh, snippet of our before file that we are uh, targeting or that we have uh, worked on. Uh, so uh, if you look at this before file, uh, this before file clearly differentiates between our uh, Rx direction, the packets which are coming from your wire to your uh, server. And also- hey, Sandeep, I cannot hear you. Oh, not hear me? Um, we can hear him actually. Now, so, is it better? No, no, no? this is the recording. During the recording. Huh. Yeah. Can you okay, see? Go ahead, yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, oh, sorry. Over. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here is a P4 file snippet that uh, we were talking about and which was working fine and we can make it offer to our IPU and then uh, uh, we could we could send the packets out of our uh, server and get into the packets. So the uh, if you look at the P4 file, it's basically uh, differentiates between the Rx packets and the TX packets. So basically the Rx packets are coming from uh, your wire to your uh, host server and your TX packets are going from your host server to wire. Also, this P4 file will can can easily differentiate between what is a control packet and what is a data packet. When I say control packet here, we are mainly focused on um, ARP packets where ARP packets for underlay will be handled by a, a control plane in kernel and ARP packets for overlay will be handled by OVS. So the... Uh, if you look at these uh, conditions here, uh, it says that if it's an RX, RX packet and if it is an R packet and it is a first pass, uh, the packet will be sent to a particular table where it looks for a few exact match uh, entries and then the packet will be sent to a particular uh, port in kernel. And this is the packet basically coming from uh, wire to our uh, host server. Here, this R packet will be handled by kernel itself. The next condition, if you see here, we have a, a condition which says that it is not an R packet. It has an inner packet and it also has an outer Mac packet. That means it is a tunnel packet that is coming to your host server. In tunnel packet, what it, it, we need to do, we need to send the packet uh, by decapping the outer packet and inner packet need to be sent to your, one of the overlay networks. These two uh, tables, when they get applied in your target okay. or in your IPU, it will it will basically does the same function. Actually, try to strip off your outer packet, and based on the inner packets, inner packets destination MAC, the packet will be sent to your particular VM. Similarly, if there is any packet just coming to only your underlay, which doesn't need to go to any your overlay network, this particular uh, condition will be hit. And these packets are not an R packet. Again, it's it's a data packet. It doesn't have any uh, uh, inner metadata, or in, it doesn't have any inner packet. It's just a, a non-tunnel packet. In this case. These packets will be sent to 
uh, kernel to handle uh, any data packet that needs to that coming from wire it will be sent to your kernel for handling the last two rules are basically for uh, packets to move across vms of same host so if there is any packet coming from vm1 or to vm2 of same host the packets will be going to your uh, pipeline in the pipeline it will see it's an arc packet it is coming from your vm1 it needs to uh, send to control plane intelligence of OVS. Like it will be sending the packet to OVS where it will take a decision or it will re-forward the packet if it is a broadcast packet or if it is a unicast control packet based on the FDB learns that has happened in OVS, it will forward the packet to those respective ports. Similarly, the other rule is from your uh, uh, OVS to VMs. The right side, if you see, these are the uh, TX packet rules. TX packet also something uh, uh, similar that we'll be doing. The packets that we are going from uh, your Host to wire will be handling in a, in a separate uh, way. And the packets that move across between your VMs should will be handled in a way. And if it is not a control packet and it is a data packet, it will be handled in a different way. And if you, if you see here, we have a recirculation table applied. This is what exactly uh, Namrata was showing that our, our uh, IPU can also, I mean, it depends on IPU uh, uh, functionalities, but it can also have a, a use case where the packet can be recirculated, where in the first pass it can fill in the uh, uh, inner packet and in the second pass it can fill in the outer packet. Similarly, uh, we have an, another table, which is your IPv4 table, which uh, will be hitting our LPM uh, 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 longest prefix max, and then it will be taking an action accordingly. This is the table which I was talking about in the second pass. If you look at this condition here, it is in the second pass where the packet will be uh, re-forwarded and it will come back to your uh, packet arbitration path and then it will go through all the blocks that are in the hardware and then finally the packet can be uh, TX out. So here is a small snippet of how your P4 program will be looking like uh, where you are, we, we can see a uh, connection tracking uh, table can have a ternary match and this will be hitting your ternary match or your WCM match in your um, uh, target or in your hardware. And uh, we have a next stop table which has an example of exact match. We have an IPv4 table which has both exact match and also an LPM. So the moment the packet passes through your hardware, it will hit these tables, it will hit these rules and the actions uh, which are defined by your, uh, either your P4 runtime or by your uh, P4 control plane which has written rules dynamically into your hardware. Uh, they will be uh, they will be hit and then the, those actions will be taken accordingly. So all this time we were talking about uh, kernel and how our kernel is trying to interact and how what is the role of kernel here. So to uh, make uh, to leverage kernel's intelligence, what we have done, we have introduced a SAI layer inside our P4 control plane, where the SAI layer is again divided into three uh, layers. These three layers are. One of them is a switch link layer, which is tightly coupled to your uh, netlink messages. Any netlink message that your kernel is sending, your switch link layer basically takes it, it will process it, it will try to add few attributes, and then it will make a call to your SAI layer. This SAI layer is nothing but your uh, open source, open computer, or P4 Lang SAI. Uh, it is incompatible with them. And the attributes that your switch link layer sends to your SAI will be in line with those attributes defined in your uh, open source SAI. That means uh, any calls that are that we see in the SAI layer can also be uh, called from any other application. Not, we need not be always switching. It can be any other application. We can directly call the SAI layer and then we can program the necessary attributes. It will take it forward. Once your switching sends a message to SAI layer, and this is the these are the calls that will be called in your SAI layer with appropriate attributes, SAI layer will switch SAI layer will try to accommodate all the attributes and then it will make a switch API call. This switch API call is uh, will be having an interaction with your TD, TDI layer, which would eventually make a call to your target. The target can be your IPU or it can be a DPDK virtual target as well. So uh, let us see the events that we are mainly interested in, or uh, which, which would really uh, give some offload from your kernel to your hardware. First uh, event that we can expect is your RIF or your uh, port creation inside the kernel. The moment a port is created, we receive an RVM, uh, RTM new link message, and this goes ahead and calls an SAI call named create router interface. This create router interface will go ahead and make a call uh, into switch API layer, which would eventually program P4 table named L2 forward RX table with an action as L2 forward. So what does this mean? Going forward, any packet that is coming to your IPU with the destination MAC as the MAC of your RIF or this port, it 
it will hit this particular table. It will hit this particular table uh, MAC address, and then it will take an action, which is your end to forward. And this port will be your net dev port. Similarly, if you go ahead and add any uh, IP address or any route on this particular IRF table, we get this new address or Dell address uh, notifications from your kernel or a new route or Dell route notification. This would eventually convert into a, a SI called name, a SI called named create next stop and create router entry. Here, create next stop will go ahead and update our local cache, but it doesn't make any uh, uh, or it doesn't program any P4 table in the target. Uh, it just updates the local cache. We take this next stop as an active next stop only when there is an active neighbor lunt with the same IP address. And also, when the route entry is created, we go ahead and program our IPv4 table, uh, which would uh, program or which would say an action as IPv4 table with the ID as your next stop ID. And three other tables will be programmed. So basically, these three other tables are the one which would tell what is your source MAC when a packet needs to go out of this particular uh, this particular port. Similarly, when a VXLAN port is created, so remember we have a differentiation, clear differentiation between who is a uh, control plane. One is overlay for overlay, it is uh, OVS, and for underlay, it is kernel. So in this case, since that uh, we need a tunnel termination, we are leveraging OVS here. We go ahead and use OVS VS CTL command uh, or utility provided by uh, OVS to create this VXLAN port. The moment we create that port, it goes ahead and creates a kernel net dev as well. Since we are also listening to uh, kernel notifications, the moment this VXLAN port is created in kernel, we again receive a NetDev uh, RT RTM new link notification. And we know this is a VXLAN port based on the attributes that we get from the netlink message. We go ahead and uh, call create tunnel or create tunnel termination table, which are basically to end cap a packet or a decap a packet when there is a uh, packet coming from the wire or when we are trying to initiate a packet. So the other main uh, uh, notification that we are very, very well, very well interested or very well uh, uh, involved is your ARP uh, notification, which is basically your neighbor learns that are happening in your kernel. The moment a neighbor learned, we get a RTM new neighbor and tell neighbor notification. This would eventually make a call to Scilayer with create neighbor entry. This goes ahead and programs your uh, neighbor mod table with a uh, uh, action asset outer mag. That means any packet that is going out for this uh, uh, for this neighbor, the MAC should be picked from the uh, from the entry that we have already programmed or we, we have learned from the kernel. Similarly, it will also uh, program the next stop table where it will sell where it will tell uh, my neighbor this is my ex neighbor and from once you hit an IPv4 table, we need to go to next stop table and these are the parameters for next stop table and next go to your neighbor table where we go ahead and set your outer information. And next comes your uh, FDB uh, entry. This FDB entry is basically uh, to any TX packets that we need to send out from your underlay to your peer device. Uh, so when, when you construct a packet, uh, it will look at this, it will hit this match table and then it will take this action and the packet will be sent out. And these are events that we uh, get from OVS, basically the source MAC learning that happens on OVS. We go ahead and program uh, L2 forward TX table, RX tunnel table and L2 forward. TX table with a different uh, action if the packet uh, has learned. On can we pause TX the video? Package. I think we'll, we'll just go live. So this is the topology that we have uh, uh, targeted or this is the topology we have put. Yeah, so a few people are complaining that they can't see that. I can't see it either. The people who are saying they can. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Namrata has graciously agreed she's going to share the slides, right? That would be a lot better. Um, yeah, I'm looking for um, how to here. There's a little uh, up arrow at the bottom. At okay. The bottom bar, yeah, and then it's it looks like meat. Can you see the screen? Yeah, maybe this time in presentation mode. Yeah. Yes, we can see it now, right? Uh, can you un, um, unmute Sandeep? Sandeep, are you here? Uh, just, you don't have to, re you have to zoom through the other ones until you get to, you have to move yeah. faster basically now. Yeah, and I okay? see Sandeep, uh, he's here and 
Uh, Sandeep, stay on mute. Today you, you'll be talking soon. Yeah, so you can unmute him. He is unmuted. Okay. Uh, but I don't hear him. I see some. Is your mic connected, Sandeep? I am uh, texting him. Yeah, I see him unmute, but his mic is showing no signal, which typically means the mic is not on or not selected or something like that. There's an audio video settings on the bottom bar, the rightmost icon. If you click on that and set the, try a few different mic devices maybe. Um, he says he's unmuted, but we still can't hear him. Yeah, the de device selection is probably wrong. Sandeep, if you can hear me, go to the bottom bar. Can you actually, can he hear us? Can you hear us, uh, Sandeep? Wait, uh, let me text him. Hmm? Hey Sandeep. Hello. Uh, yeah, can you hear us? Your mic is on. I think the previous audio was better. <laughs> yeah, the previous audio will get fixed in like a minute. Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I had. Uh, I had in the recorded session, I had asked him to fix it. So if you want, we can just forward to the fixed part and uh, go over that if his mic doesn't work. Hold on, I think I can make that happen. No? The video is gone? Oh, OK. Um, let's see if we can do both, just the audio from the video recording. I think you need TSN. Any TSN experts here? We, we'll just do, play the video. If we can put both on screen, we'll do the slides from live and the audio from there. We can't put both on screen. I think if you present, it should work, no? I think you can both present. Yeah, All right. See? Uh, should we go to the next talk while they prepare, maybe, and then we can come back? I don't know if that's a good idea because people might be coming for the Jamal, can you, uh, Jamal, can you please try um, uh, where we left off, right? Just just forward it like a minute or two. No, no, no. And then you should see the full screen. Okay, in the, so we, in the recording we, itself. Okay, so we, we, we just, yes, we're skipping some sections and then it'll be good. Yeah, like uh, like one, the, that hmm. same slide that he was talking. Uh, he'll talk more in detail. There's more in the presentation. So I think it will get covered. I think she's saying there is uh, it's full screen after, after like one minute into the. Yeah. Uh, can you just play it and then let's forward a little bit. So, but hang on. So there is something. Okay, Namrata, you need to get off the sharing. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks for number. Yeah, if you uh, get programmed into OBS or uh, the P4 pipeline or um, uh, tables are basic is basically an exact match with PNA add-on table to SDN controller, and that is this P4 file clearly differentiates between our uh, RX direction. Over. Okay. Um, it's are coming from uh, your wire to your uh, um, R packet host server. Okay. Keep, keep, and based on the forward. inner packet, it will yeah. be sent to your kernel for hand. Going from uh, match, we have an IPv4 table with open source, open computer, uh, 
which which so when the route entry is created or create tunnel termination table from the entry that we have already programming few control yeah forward okay. a little bit more it's yeah then he's fixing more. now he's fixing now yeah let me uh, represent this Uh, let me know if you guys are able to see the presentation mode now. Yes. Okay. Is it better now? Is that live? Yeah. No, no. That's not live. That. That's recorded. So we fixed yeah, So we were at uh, uh, FRR module, like where we have leveraged open source FRR, where internally we go ahead and enable BGP module as well. And this BGP module uh, will be listening for your uh, BGP packets. And uh, based on the BGP packets that it have received, it will go ahead and program your uh, uh, kernel with the routes that it has learned or it has redistributed or it has got from your uh, PM. These, these basically are running on top of the underlay network, which is your P0 and P1 header, which is there on your uh, kernel, which are nothing but one-to-one uh, -one mapping to your uh, physical ports P0 and P1. So any, any packet that is coming to your P0 physical port, if it is a control plane packet, we would have programmed a rule saying that if it is a control plane packet, especially an R packet, the packet should directly go to your P0 net dev. And if it is a from coming from P1 net dev, the packet should go to your P1 net dev. So, so, so based on this, any packets that are coming uh, here will be landing on a kernel. If there is any uh, netting notification for them, it will come and reach your uh, RP4 uh, control plane as well. And then the, the target or uh, your hardware will be programmed with the necessary uh, um, match fields and match keys and actions. So this is our underlay network and the overlay network is your OVS where again your uh, we would have written a control plane rules to say that any packets that are coming to your uh, physical port or any packets that are coming to your pipeline would should reach a particular uh, a net dev and we would have created multiple sub interfaces of uh, uh, with VLAN type and a VLAN tag to them and these will be under your host one net dev. So these packets, so that means any packet coming to your host one dev with a VLAN tag will eventually go ahead and land on those VLAN net devs. And we go ahead and add all these VLAN net devs to a particular bridge, OVS bridge. So that means any packet coming from your pipeline to your host one dev with a VLAN tag will reach onto your uh, VLAN net dev and from there to your OVS bridge. If it is a broadcast packet, the packet will go to every other port. Your OVS itself will reforward it. If it is an unicast packet and if there was all in an FTB learning, your OVS itself does that intelligence it sends out of a particular VLAN net dev and eventually the packet will reach your host or net dev and come to your FXP pipeline. So uh, I won't touch much about your overlay network uh, because it, there is no much kernel involved in it. It is more into your OVS concept. So let us look at how our uh, underlay network where our kernel is more uh, uh, involved. I'll be showing a quick uh, um, animation to say that how the packets are coming and what, what happens when the packet comes. So uh, let us see how an underlay uh, ARP resolution happens. So the moment a packet reaches on your physical port, as I was saying, we would have written a control plane rule saying that any control packet that is coming to your FXP pipeline, if it is RX packet from your uh, physical port, the packet should go to its corresponding net dev. So this packet will reach the kernel net dev. Both, both the packets will reach your kernel net dev here. Since it is an R packet, your kernel itself will learn the neighbor and it will populate a neighbor entry in the kernel. At this moment, uh, a dynamic neighbor entry is created in your kernel. And then for any user space daemon which is listening to this uh, net or netting notifications, they get notified with these particular uh, events. The moment RP4 control plane receives these events, we go ahead and program a few tables in the hardware, which is your L2 forward TX table, uh, which says that uh, the packet came on P0 net dev uh, and it, uh, the action is go to your P0 net dev. Going forward, any packet with the destination MAC as your P0 net dev should go to your P0 net dev port. And also you program your name or bot table, which would uh, tell that any packet that need to TX should use this particular P0 net dev's MAC. Okay, so now that we have had uh, ARP learning, now it's time to uh, have a route learning as well. So as I was mentioning, the route learning, we have used uh, FRR. So FRR is an uh, open sourced uh, utility, which is compatible with uh, any OS, uh, OS distribution. 
So uh, this FRR provides us an IP routing services, and then we can go ahead and install and uh, this FRR in our distribution. So and on top of this FRR, we can go ahead and also enable the uh, routing protocol that we we are much interested in. So the moment you enable the routing protocols, the routing protocol will be listening to those particular uh, protocol messages. And those based on the routes that are learned by your uh, routing protocol, those routes will be programmed on your uh, on your kernel and the user space, whoever listening to those route notifications, they can get the route notification and then program uh, target with specific uh, match keys and match actions. So here is a small animation on how uh, the packets that are coming from uh, wire to your kernel and how FRR goes ahead and programs with the kernel and what happens with our control plane or our info P4D. So the moment an uh, packet comes to your physical port, this packet will go ahead and land on your P0, uh, P0 uh, net dev. And also the packet coming on your P1 net dev will go ahead and land on your P1 net dev. These packets, since these are, we would have added these packets as part of our FRR, uh, uh, FRR configuration. BGP daemon will be listening to the BGP packets that are received on these net devs. The moment the packets are received, this BGP daemon will go ahead and program routes in your kernel. Again, these kernel entries will be Listened by our uh, uh, user space program, which is an infra P4D, and it goes ahead and program IPv4 table and next stop table in your target. So that means going forward, any packets, any packets that needs to go out of your box, if it needs to be having this routing intelligence, it will can look at these particular tables and the packet can be reforwarded accordingly. It will go ahead and uh, add your outer packet. It will add your outer source MAC, destination MAC, and then outer source IP, destination IP, and the packet will be sent out by your FXP. So all this intelligence will be programmed in FXP by our Infra P4D, except for a few control plane rules that have been programmed by our uh, runtime client. So here is a quick recap that uh, we have done, we have seen till now, where uh, we program control plane rules between our physical port to your kernel net devs, and also your V port, which is your overlay network to your uh, a net dev which is there in uh, which is there to handle all the vm uh, control packets and we, where we go ahead and add a vlan and send it to that net dev we send it to your uh, sub interface vlan net dev from there it go to your obs similarly uh, the underlay connectivity will be given to the kernel where it will be listening to your kernel notifications for arc node it will be listening to your uh, rtm uh, new neighbor and real neighbor notifications and for uh, route it will be listening to your uh, rtm new route and del note notifications so based on these kernel notifications we go ahead and program a uh, few tables in the hardware which would eventually uh, forward the packet where your offloading from kernel has been went to your uh, ipu going forward any data packets your ipu has all intelligence to go ahead and uh, re-forward these packets yeah so uh, over to you uh, namrata Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, so we have some useful links here that can be um, uh, that can be used to um, use for information on IPDK and the Linux networking pipeline that we've shown. And uh, we'll open up to questions now if, if anyone has any questions. Any questions? Okay, I'll bring a question that's on stage here which is from Vlad. Uh, is it showing up on the stage yet? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Vlad is asking if Infra P4D is open source. I think it is, but I'll let yes. the authors respond. Yes, um, so Infra P4D, uh, the whole integrated model is open sourced on IPDK-IO, and the link is uh, in the last slide. Um, and it is, um, we are actually changing the architecture to the one that I showed, and uh, that is also open sourced under networking recipe under IPDK IO. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, there's a question from, okay, go on. Uh, uh, what's the use case? So use case is basically to offload uh, the kernel networking stack onto the IPU. Yeah, who needs that? The cloud providers, basically, um, who have um, 
who have services running on their servers and uh, they might want to offload the networking onto the IPO to create more space for um, containers and VMs for services. This is SmartNIC okay. and IPO use case. Right, so they're basically putting a switching infrastructure thing in the server itself. Right. Okay. Uh, what well, you have doubts if people need this, Alastair? Or no, I'm just curious. What, right. how, does it, how big does it have to scale? How many are they? Somebody trying to download the whole of the internet roundtable to the uh, the NIC? What, what's the? I, know, I think yeah, I think the IPU should be able to hold the whole PGP routes if you want. It's it's on a it's a NIC though, right? So. How yeah. Big? How many? I. And I'm right, uh, you, you think you can hold the whole BGP tree in there? Um, so we can hold about um, uh, 16K uh, routes, more than that, actually. Um, we 16? have not, uh, yeah, so the, so the so four parallel tables the, of 16K is but that's there. That's just the implementation you have, right? It's not necessarily the limitation of the NIC. Right, so we haven't done the performance analysis yet. So okay. when we do that, we'll release the numbers. All right. I, I just want to add, so it's actually a million related routes. So yeah, it's uh, the LPM itself is a 32K node LPM, which supports a million related routes is what we go with. Yeah, and I think you were asking who needs it. Uh, you know, all the hyperscalers, they offload their um, infrastructure switch onto their server smart devices like SmartNICs or IPU, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Namrata. And, oh, is there any more question? No, no, I'm saying hold on to the mic. Just, just in case somebody... Uh, uh, oh, there's a question. Where is it? How come I can see it? Yeah, I mean, we are using an LPM table here. So when I say related routes, you're adding like subnet based, um, you know, uh, matches. And that's why I say related routes. I, I think you should read that as there is a hashing scheme involved and it is not fully expanded. Yeah, uh, but I don't think anybody heard you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think that's uh, about it. Let's give her a round of applause. Thanks, uh, Namrata Sandeep.